Hey, well, welcome everyone. My name is Shirley and I will be your moderator this evening. I am excited to welcome Eric Pook, president of Sirius Consulting Group and David Harris, chief executive officer at Prosperitin as our speakers this evening to discuss employee theft. If you have any questions during the webinar, please type them in the Q&A section and we will answer questions live at the end of the presentation. Eric and David, welcome and thank you so much with, for being with us tonight. I will pass it over to you now. Pleasure. Thanks so much, Shirley. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've got a, a, a true treat. Uh, first of all, welcome to the Henry Schein Dental Academy for those of you that haven't joined before. Uh, and we have uh, a great new speaker joining us tonight, uh, David Harris. David Harris, uh, certainly you might have seen him throughout any of the major dental conferences as one of the great keynote speakers across the board and truly one of the foremost experts in why do employees steal in the uh, unbelievable word, I guess, uh, world of dental embezzlement. So David's pretty unique, right? Uh, a self-described rule breaker in his youth, David changed direction, spent much of his adult life in the world of investigation and enforcement, where he uses the unrivaled uh, ability to understand the criminal thought process and educate how to protect dentists because no different than the office lease. What we're certainly seeing today is, is truly how, uh, how difficult it is to currently open and run a dental practice. And how disheartening is it after working and putting your blood, sweat and tears to have a disastrous situation with the lease of the landlord or to find out one of your most trusted uh, associates and employees have actually been stealing. Uh, David is the CEO of Prosperident, as Shirley mentioned, right? The world's largest firm for investigating financial crimes committed against dentists. He's the author of a book on dental embezzlement, The Art of Theft, and The Science of Control, and over 30 articles in dental publications. Uh, David's also a licensed private investigator, a forensic certified public accountant, uh, and a certified fraud examiner. So it is a true privilege uh, to be joining. David, welcome. Eric, great to be with you and uh, Shirley and the, and, and, and the Henry Shine team. Uh, really appreciate you having me as well. Um, let's, uh, whoops, let's get started. And I'm going to call my presentation Hidden in Plain Sight. What we're going to see is uh, a practice in Virginia, uh, an orthodontic practice, and the office manager took $370,000. Um, you're going to get to hear from the victim uh, and also from one of our team who was the lead investigator in the case, and they'll each be telling you a little bit about what happened. But before I get there, I want to, I want to address the, the basic problems question. In other words, how relevant is this to me if I'm a dentist? And the answer is pretty relevant. So the numbers I'm going to give you came from an American Dental Association study that was done in 2019. And what the ADA did was they asked about 19,000 dentists, have you been stolen from? So let's start with the good news. Um, and the good news is that 53% of those surveyed said, you know, as far as I know, I haven't been. So you know what's coming. The other 47% said yes, but the ADA asked that 47%, okay, how many times? And now it gets a little interesting. 26%, so about half those who said yes, said, as far as I know, I've been stolen from once. Have 11% twice, 2% the triple dippers. And the one that really makes me scratch my head is that 8% of the respondents had been stolen from at least four times. So if you just do a little frequency exercise here and you take 26% times one, and 11% times two and 2% 2 times three and 8% times, let's assume just four, what you end up with is 92 embezzlements have already happened per 100 dentists. Now, there are some things we don't know here. For example, we don't know how many of that 53% who said, no, I don't think I have been embezzled actually had an either didn't know it or, or for whatever reason decided not to tell the ADA. 
We also don't know how many of the, that 53% will get embezzled in the rest of their careers and how many of the other 47% will get embezzled from again. The best number I can give you is that if you were graduating from dental school today, the chance that you'd be hit at some point in your career is probably about 70, 70%. So this is not something that affects a small corner of the dental profession. It is a mainstream issue. And when I speak to live audiences, what becomes evident is everybody's got a story. I mean, they were either embezzled themselves or they knew somebody else who had been embezzled or you know, one of their, one of their classmates had, uh, had had, had a, uh, a, a major issue with it. And Eric's gonna talk about leasing in a few minutes and how much a bad lease can cost you. Um, embezzlement and leasing are, are comparable probably in their ability to do financial damage to a practice. The average amount in dentistry that a thief steals to the point where they get caught is about $109,000. So that's, that's on average. And to answer the question somebody's gonna ask me sooner or later, the biggest embezzlement I ever saw was about $2 million. And that was taken from a two doctor practice over about six and a half years. So one other number I wanna give you before we leave the, the, the whole question of prevalence is what's the long-term trend? And unfortunately, the long-term trend is not very good for dentistry. So I mentioned that the study where I put the pie graph up was done in 2019. In 2007, so 12 years earlier, the ADA asked the same question. And in 2007, 35% of dentists said, yes, they'd been stolen from. So look what happened. Over a 12 year period, the prevalence of embezzlement went up by about a third. And to point out the very obvious from all this, these are all pre-COVID numbers. There hasn't really been any scientific study done since COVID hit in 2020 about what's going on with embezzlement, but I can tell you unscientifically that we're seeing a, a further upward trend. So it's a big problem. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna let you uh, learn a little bit more about what happened to our victim, whose name is Dr. David Hughes. Um, and there he is. He's an orthodontist in West Springfield, Virginia. And I mentioned already that he lost somewhere between a quarter million and a half a million dollars from this lady, whose name is Lisa Anselm. And uh, David's been kind enough to uh, record some video that I'm gonna share with you. And he's gonna talk about how it happened and um, the things that he feels he missed with the benefit of hindsight. And he's also gonna talk about what he thinks you should do um, to protect yourselves. There's one more uh, actor in the drama who I wanna introduce, and she's a very special lady. Her name is Wendy Askins. We have, whoops, we have three levels of investigators at Prosperident. Uh, Wendy occupies the, the top level. So she's one of, of four people we call supervising examiners, and these are our most capable investigators. We have, um, I think our current head count is 19 investigators and, and four of them are at the very apex and that includes Wendy. And Wendy's particular specialty is orthodontic practices, which is what this one happens to be. So the, the first question, of course, everybody wants to know is, well, how did it happen? And we're a little careful about putting methodologies in the public domain simply because our job is to empower dentists without simultaneously um, giving thieves more knowledge. So uh, David's going to be just a little bit cagey here, but I think he'll give you some good information. And as the investigation continued, I was, I was floored, absolutely floored by the extent of the embezzlement and the, the breadth of complexity of the multiple strategies being used in payroll and the company credit cards and the cash payments that were being diverted and the, the mirroring of things that we, like vendors and suppliers that we use, there were parallel accounts set up. 
so that the credit card statement would have recognizable vendors, but those purchases were actually going toward personal purchases and Amazon. One of the things that we know about thieves is that most of them use multiple methods. In other words, we see very few one trick ponies. Um, it's just like what you would do with money in your 401k. I mean, you typically wouldn't take it all and buy, let's say, Apple stock. You would spread it around. Thieves think exactly the same way. So the norm, and, and it's very consistent with what was happening with David, the norm for a thief is to use three distinct methodologies at once. And over time, the, the, the three methods that they use may shift. In other words, they may stop using one and pick up a different one, but that, that number three is very constant. One thing that embezzlers do, as I've learned, is that they they convince the doctor that they're irreplaceable. And that's a that's an absolute red flag for people that know better and are alert to this. And believe me, I beat myself up about all of these these di different weaknesses that I had and were obvious to her. But she saw that I was watching certain things and not other things. And honestly, the embezzlement went on for about five years, it just, things were not adding up to me, but she would always say, oh, it's it's understandable, or you know, the costs have gone up. Uh, a lot of things that he said there. Um, the most important thing for me is that embezzlement's an interactive crime. In other words, a lot of times I'll see on, for example, a Facebook group, I'll see, somebody posting that, you know, they got embezzled a certain way. And some other dentist will chime in and say, well, you know, that wouldn't have happened if you had only, I don't know, taken the deposit to the bank yourself. Um, when a thief embezzles, it's, it's kind of like a poker game and the dentist cards are face up and the thief's cards are hidden. They know exactly what your control system is and, and embezzlement is really, a crime of navigation where they 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 build a way to steal the skirts around your scrutiny and that's that's exactly what david said um and the other part is overt manipulation you know they superficially they look like ideal employees and they're stealing there are a lot of behavioral markers to embezzlement in other words when people are stealing they tend to get forced to act in certain ways for example one uh, one classic, and it's, it, it doesn't apply to every embezzlement pattern, but in a lot of stealing, the thief will not take vacation. They will come up with all kinds of excuses why they really can't leave the office. And in part, it's because they want to control the way that information flows through the practice. In other words, when they're gone, they, they can't exert that control anymore. And in part, it's to convince you that they are the most loyal, hardworking employee you ever saw. And that's the manipulation part. One thing that embezzlers do, as I've learned, is that they they convince the doctor that they're irreplaceable. Oops, we heard that already. Let's uh, let's keep going here. I felt vulnerable, and I asked my accountant. Okay, so we're uh, we're just glitching a little bit here, folks. Uh, let me try the next one. I felt vulnerable, and I asked my accountants for an audit just to because there was a lot of money flowing in and out of the practice for the purpose of the, you know, the, the debt service on this expansion um, renovation. I just wanted to make sure there were eyes on all of those transactions. And it was weird. I don't remember their response precisely, but they basically declined. Like that wasn't really their role. Uh, unfortunately, David learned the hard way what a, a lot of other people have also found out as well. You know, you, you tend to think that your accountant is kind of in the front line of your embezzlement defense. And that, you know, if something were happening, your accountant would spot it. Here's the part that a lot of people don't necessarily think about with dentistry. It is one of the few businesses I know where the accounting software is kind of split into two parts. So revenue is tracked by practice management software, you know, like Dentrix, for example. And expenses are tracked by a totally separate piece of software, normally accounting software like QuickBooks. 
And the two of them really don't talk to each other. The second thing is that if you're in the United States, you can use what's called the cash method of accounting. And what that means is that your accountants do not need to look at all, and I'll stress that, at all at your practice management software. They can do all of their work from your bank statements and your cancel checks. And they do not need to even take a glance at your practice management software. And most stealing happens on the revenue side in dental practices, which means that the concealment is done inside your practice management software. So the, the biggest area where stealing might be visible is something that is just not looked at at all by your account. And David found out, as I say, the hard way that his accountants were not the front line of his defense against embezzlement. Um, what did David learn from all this? Well, he's, he's got some, some great wisdom. Let's hear it. Embezzlement, dealing with embezzlement is about prevention. I, I'm part of a, an unenviable fraternity in my state with two other orthodontists that have had this happen to them. All three of us are speaking to our local societies to try to help others. You, you won't get your money back. You won't get your sleep back. Just prevent this from happening. Put the safeguards in place. Put, put, please work, work with prosperity. And I'm not aware of anyone else that does this in, in, in the way that they do it and helps you. It's kind of like dentistry. If I went to you as a patient and said, doctor, I want to spend the least money in my lifetime on my teeth. What you'd probably say to me next is um, become really good friends with your toothbrush and your floss and come in and see us every six months like clockwork because the cost and the intrusiveness of those things is far, far, far less than what will happen if you neglect those basics. And I'd say exactly the same thing about your practice. Prevention is, is inevitably going to be better than the cure. So what does prevention look like? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep you in suspense on that one because I want to show you one more slide first. Uh, so we mentioned Lisa Anselm, the thief. She, um, she was fired by Dr. Hughes in um, 2000, in 2023. And yeah, that's how long it takes for the law to catch up with people. Uh, she got sentenced to three years in prison and was ordered to pay him back $200,000. Uh, so... Dr. Hughes and I mentioned Wendy Askins, the investigator, were both in the courtroom when Lisa got sentenced. And I've, I've got a, a little bit of comment from each of them. So let's see what they, what they say about that. And it just felt like the justice system was doing um, justice to what happened. So it was, there was closure even before the verdict was read, there was a, an element of closure in just being heard and having the facts, the black and white numbers and facts um, presented to the court and read aloud by the judge. Um, I felt a lot of excitement just throughout the entire day, the excitement that this was the closing hopefully of one chapter for David, but the beginning of a new chapter for the thief who is now going to suffer the punishment for it. Yeah, so we took her out of circulation. Um, unfortunately, there are a lot more Lisa Anselms out there. So what do we do about this? Well, I'm going to give you some, some basic ideas. Um, these are pretty powerful tools, but the the first thing I want to talk about is what are called timing differences. And what I mean by timing differences is this is when the recording of a payment in your practice management software happens on a different day from when the money hits your bank. So the, the classic case of this is like if, if somebody pays your practice today by credit card, your practice management software will treat that as a payment today. but Typically, there are about two settlement days before the money hits your bank. Um, and 
these things mess everything up when you're trying to confirm that the amount of money you collected according to your practice management software lines up perfectly with what got deposited in your bank. Because it's not as simple as looking at today's collections and, and going in your online banking tonight and seeing that amount deposited. Um, and what that means is that a lot of dentists have given up what used to be the norm in every practice of trying to match up collections versus deposits. If you don't do that really basic matchup, what happens is you empower the dumbest, laziest thief on the planet to successfully steal from you. The problem though is if you're trying to do this at the end of the day, so many of your transactions have a time offset. I mentioned credit card payments. The other one that has a time offset and it's in the opposite direction is when an insurance company pays you by direct deposit. Because when that happens, they send the, the money and the EOB, the explanation of benefits out at the same time. The money goes electronically, so it's in your bank in about half an hour. The EOB goes via the US Postal Service and arrives a few days later at your practice, and then a staff member opens it and doesn't see any particular urgency to enter that one into practice management software because it, uh, it, the money is already in your bank. In, in their mind, there's no particular urgency. Um, so when you look at a single day, the, the timing differences can be massive. And unless you want to try to track them all down, which is a, which is a huge nuisance, um, it, it becomes a daunting task. The one thing about timing differences, though, is that they reverse. So let's say we're, we're sitting here in the last day of the month and uh, you get a $4,000 credit card payment on the last day. And let's assume that's the only timing difference for the month, obviously a, a very simplified example. This month, your practice management software collections are going to exceed your bank deposits by $4,000. But then there's a reversal. So next month, you're going to start with a $4,000 deposit that was already counted the month before in your practice management software. So what happens with timing differences, if, if that's what's causing discrepancies between practice management software and your bank, and you look at them over time, you're going to see something. I mean, this is a nice, neat sine wave. The, the, the real thing is probably a little messier. But what you should be seeing here is if you plotted a line to this, like if you used a regression and you plotted a line, that the slope would be pretty close to zero. If the slope isn't zero, then what you're seeing is not a timing difference. It's something else. So a few things to do, and we'll come right back to that, uh, that sine wave in a minute. The first thing is hire properly. And there are a number of elements to this, um, but I'll mention four. The first thing is 70 million Americans. So that equates to one in four adults has a criminal record. And yet the norm in dentistry, which is very different from how the rest of America hires, is that we don't check for criminal records. And if you don't, you're playing Russian roulette. The second thing that's vital is to speak with former employers. Um, and I'm going to give a, a, a really, it will seem obvious when I say it, but a very basic tip here. Do not ever call any phone number for a former employer that somebody applying for a job gives you. In other words, go look for the number online and call that number. Because otherwise, somebody hands you a phone number and you call it and you're talking to the applicant's uncle on a disposable cell phone who pretends to be their last employer and gives a good reference. Um, it also astounds me that the norm in dentistry is not to drug test people. I mean, I, I can't get a job um, delivering the crap people buy on Amazon without a drug test, and yet I can probably work in most of your practices. And given that you hold the keys to the pharmacy, that makes no sense. Um, social networking is another thing that isn't as, as looked at as it should be when people are hiring. So some basic hiring tips. The second building block of protection is what I call transaction integrity. And what I mean by that is to make sure that what got entered into practice management software is what really happened today. Um, the first thing I'm gonna tell you is if you're a practice owner, print your own reports. As soon as you allow somebody else to print a report and hand it to you, what you've given up 
is control over the assumptions used to generate that report. And a lot of stealing involves what is called selective reporting. In other words, where somebody um, manages to suppress some information about what's going on in your practice that they just don't want you to see. So if you're not sure how to print your own reports, there's a software trainer from the company that made your practice management software that would love to help you. What I'd like to see is tra transactions reviewed at the end of each day. In other words, before you go home, take a look at what happened in your practice today according to practice management software. And this is where you're gonna notice that uh, what you did was a four surface composite, but it got uh, entered into Dentrix as a three surface. You know, it's probably not embezzlement, but it still cost you money. Um, your team, the billers on your team, so hygienists, associated dentists, they should also review their own personal work and sign off on it. Um, if you're the practice owner, you should look at the whole practice. Um, but here's the, here's the radical piece. Traditionally, that matching of collections to deposits that I mentioned was something we did at the end of each day. And back in 1989, which is when I started working with dental practices, that made total sense because in those days there were not any timing differences. Everything happened on the, on the same day in, in practice management software or the, the old pegboard system that was the manual system before that. Everything happened the same day as what happened in the bank. Um, now it's a lot more complicated and my suggestion would be don't try that on a daily basis. In other words, your daily review is really limited to did stuff get entered into um, practice management software correctly. For example, if you have a hygienist um, and your protocol is that people get annual radiography, then if the hygienist saw 12 patients today, you should see about, uh, about six sets of bite wings. If the uh, protocol is that uh, there should be a, a panoramic every five years, then again, with, with 12 patients, you should see around one panel. And then at month end, this is when you do your thing. And the, the beauty of looking at a month at a time instead of a day at a time for this comparison is A, it's a lot more efficient, and B, most of the timing differences have self-corrected. Um, what I'd suggest to you is compare collections to deposits. Don't try to track down what caused the, the difference between these two, just put a point on a graph. And if you see that kind of sine wave pattern and the slope is like zero, then you're, you're pretty comfortable in saying that what's causing me the difference between software and collections is, or between collections and bank rather, is timing differences. If somebody's stealing, the graph will look different. Um, you guys all think of articulation as being that friendship that the mandible has with the maxilla. And that's one kind of articulation. The other kind I think of as financial articulation. And what financial articulation means very simply is this. If your office was open 20 days this month and in your left hand, you have 20 day end reports and in your right hand, you have one monthly summary report, the total of the 20 for fees, collections, and payments should be the same as the one. If that's not the case, probably what happened is somebody came in after hours and did some stuff they didn't want you to see. So you've already looked at those 20 day end reports because you're doing that at the end of each day. Now, what the articulation um, exercise is doing is asking you, is there something that isn't on those 20 day ends? Because if there is, it sure as heck is relevant. I'm going to turn it back over to my friend, Eric. Um, there's my company's name and our phone number. And we do two things for dentists. We uh, do investigations and we can do stealthy, in other words, covert investigations, because a lot of times the person we're investigating is still working in the practice. And we also work proactively with you. And you remember when David Hughes said, do what you can to prevent this. We can help with that. Um, thank you very much. It's been uh, fun to hang out with you guys. And uh, Eric, uh, all yours. David, I tell you, every time we've done these over the years, there's always new little tidbits. One thing that I've done in, in, in my business as well is uh, monitoring alarm system codes. That was always a big one. 
uh, as well as uh, making sure that all the credit card statements, et cetera, are digital. If they are paper, they go directly to my home, right, for corporate credit cards rather than to the office. So two other little tidbits that I've, I've learned from David's great knowledge. We're going to do some great Q&A, guys. So uh, if you haven't posted one already, uh, we will go through some great Q&A and uh, help pick David's mind here as we go through, as well as, uh, first of all, pretty pretty incredible feedback. Uh, a lot of you got the email, just checking in prior to the webinar, uh, and certainly had some great questions about tonight. I know there was uh, some last minute emergency cases, et cetera, and uh, yes, we'll be recorded as we go through the process uh, and happy to share that afterwards. Uh, I mean, we're gonna pull up a quick poll uh, and again, uh, sort of help customize some of the additional content here based on your situation. So what you'll see here is some quick questions as well as at the end, there'll be a quick section to uh, have a, a complimentary consult with David and his team uh, as well. But just a couple of quick ones, right? Do you own or do you lease your space today? Uh, what currently describes your current situation? Are you thinking of opening or relocating? Are you planning to buy or acquire? Right. Are you planning to transition in the next five years, which <laughs> I don't know what it is lately, but the majority of the doctors I've talked to have all said, yeah, I'm ready to retire yesterday. So oh, certainly seems like the world is becoming a little more challenging these days. Uh, or to say, you know what, I'm planning to hunker down, right, ride the wave and continue to build on the momentum over the past few years. Uh, quick question about managing growth, you'll see there as well. Again, for those of you looking at that from a Rockefeller glass half full approach. Uh, and then quickly, when does your lease expire? Right. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, many of you, if you haven't already, uh, happy to pull up some demographics, rental rate reports, uh, or to run through a quick uh, conversation based on your specific situations. Uh, and we'll have the same for David here shortly. So, well, this, uh, the part B of this tonight is to also look at some of the key pieces about transitions and more importantly, what to do now at the early stage of your career to help put a protective force field around those eventual practice sale proceeds and uh, prepare yourself, heaven forbid something were to happen to you, right, for the unthinkable, but that emergency exit. So part of the strategy tonight is what can we do now at the early stage of our career, mid-career, and ready for transitioning, right, to help protect yourself for the unknown. So three numbers I wanted to quickly kick off. The first is 85. 85% of dentists have a, a section in their lease that can prevent them from ever selling their practice. Full stop. Uh, and this has only increased post COVID uh, as landlords are realizing now what is the value of the dental practice and how it uh, they pay, play a pivotal role to see if and how that practice is assigned or aligned. Uh, number uh, two here is that 54%, and this is up post COVID as well, of dentists are overpaying in rent today. So if you've ever said, boy, oh boy, why are they advertising, right? $32 per square foot, right? Or if you're in California, $3.26 per square foot, right? When I'm paying four bucks a square foot, that doesn't quite add up. Why am I getting paid more? Right? It's like with the uh, the cable companies. Why am I paying more as an existing client when they're giving deals to new you know to new tenants? Uh, and last but not least, eighty percent of landlords structure to lease structure the lease to give them a percentage of their practice sale proceeds. Uh, I had the privilege of speaking and doing some CE courses down at Thrive Live for those of you that joined us down in Vegas at uh, at Caesars this year, Bellagio last year. But we were digging into this, and one of the attendees in Northern California. We were talking about transitions, et cetera, and said, look, I'm just about to buy a clinic. I went to talk to the landlord about term and you know what they were open to. And the landlord came back at me square faced and said, why would you buy the doctor's practice? Just come to me directly and I'll give you a lease directly. Right. And then how much is the practice worth now without the keys? And the rest of the, the, the audience, the 100 people at the CE course sort of looked around and gasped, but it was, it was such uh, you know, a story that we're hearing more and more often that literally the landlord was ready to leapfrog over the existing dentist, charge an extra five or 10%, 
right? And then suddenly what's the previous dentist selling? Well, rather than selling the million dollar clinic, suddenly now they're just selling charts for pennies on the dollar, right? And the depreciation gear. So how do we protect ourselves? Well, you know, as David mentioned, we are pretty unique. We're the only healthcare specialized tenant advisory and lease negotiation firm of our kind in North America, proud partner of Shines for the past 10 years, right? And uh, really we've never been busier with almost 300 active negotiations going on currently. Here's the story as, uh, as David introduces us to his clients as he has over the years is there's an imbalance, right? There's an imbalance today that you who have spent an ungodly amount of time in school and investment into yourself and your professional experience to suddenly then become an entrepreneur and own a business and sign employment contracts and be an employer, let alone signing a lease that seems fine at $5,000 a month, but suddenly realizing over the next 20 years could represent over $2.6 million of financial commitment. So the landlord now is the world's oldest profession, the Lord of the land. Right. And they are holding all the cards. I thought you'd like that one, David. All right. And they're holding all the cards. I, I had right? thought of another profession when you said the world. Well, world that's, profession, that's for another okay. conversation. Needless to say, right? It's a great uh, perspective of now looking at, again, the, their team of lawyers, right? And over millennia, they've found a great way to make the lease as landlord friendly as possible. And most doctors fall on the trap to basically say that I am going to be the first, right? Or focus on the first half of the first page, base rent, annual increases, et cetera. And, and you miss out on the remaining 72 and a half other pages in the lease that could have devastating impacts, right? So from that perspective, if you feel that there's a leverage imbalance between the two, that's where we fit in 29 years ago. Right, the whole perspective here is how do we help to protect ourselves? How do we help to make sure that we've given ourselves the opportunity to ensure that we've got an alignment? So where we fit in is just a simple overview, but we help to equal the imbalance. We leverage the 13,000 of these and we speak landlord, right? Some of our team used to work on the landlord side. So we've hired them from the dark side to now help negotiate for the doctor rather than against the doctor. So from that perspective, it's important because you are the best tenant on the planet. Let me explain why. You have some of the highest build-out costs. Many of you through the process now are building at it over $350 to $400 per square foot, number one. Number two is you have the lowest default rates, roughly 0.5%. Take a guess at what it is for a restaurant. You would be shocked to know that averages is over 90% that that restaurant won't be there after 10 years, right? Yet the dental practice is typically in the same location for over 26 and a half years. So best tenant, highest build out cost, lowest default, you're COVID proof, you can't work from home, heaven forbid another global pandemic, right? And yet you're the least likely to get professional help or to try to do it yourself and fall into the trap of landlords feeling like they can take advantage versus all the other tenants in the space have some sort of help, right? Let it be their corporate representative if they're a franchise, right? Uh, or someone else that is non-commission driven to help maximize the financial wins. So that's the purpose of specific examples from some of your peers. So here's a few, right? And these came from Dr. Tom Schneider uh, uh, through the webinar we did recently, which really then touched on some of the main components as to why the practice sale failed all because of the stupid lease agreement. Uh, so this was a, a typical scenario where the buyer just got frustrated because of the previous negotiations going on between the landlord and the seller. So what occurred here was fully financed transition. Everything was good to go, right? The buyer and seller negotiated on the purchase price. They paid all the lawyer fees to do the purchase agreement and the share and asset purchase agreement. Uh, however, at the 11th hour, they said, okay, well, the lease is, the, the deal is conditional on the successful assignment of the lease. Right. The lease was then being assigned. The landlord said, OK, well, per Article 76 of Section 2, right, you, selling doctor, are still personally and continually liable on this lease as much as you are today, 
right, through the process. So as a result, the seller said, absolutely not, right? Hey, I just want to collect my cash and go. And the landlord said, hang on a second, right? Are, you're just leaving me holding the bag? No way. So basically all of this back and forth is going on over the course of many weeks and months. And suddenly the, the purchaser comes back and says, look, this is nuts. If it's this hard for the doctor to sell, I don't want to move in here. Because what are they going to do to me as the young associate now paying the million bucks to take over the practice? Right. So all of that was because the lease was not properly structured for that eventual transition. Right. And because of that continuing liability, it's so much harder to get absolved of that at the point of sale. So much easier, 5, 10, 15, 20 years in advance when there's lots of runway. Right. So you're not stuck between that proverbial rock and a hard place. Uh, number two, this was an interesting one, again, from Dr. Tom Schneider, where uh, it was about the financial strength of the purchaser. So what it stated in the lease is that the new leasee must have at least 50% net assets of the seller, or the seller is liable for another five years after the sale. So <laughs> imagine that. How many new young associates are going to be at your equivalent net worth, or even half of it, right, at the time the, of sale? Right. So needless to say, unfortunately, suddenly now the, the landlord then rejected the assignment and the signor and killed the deal. Uh, number three was month to month lease. And for those of you uh, on the exit poll, if you are in a month to month lease situation, nothing gets more riskier. Right. And it does completely open yourself up because what are you selling? Right? What's the continuity and predictability of revenue? What's the cash flow? If technically you or the landlord wake up in the morning and there's a brown envelope on your door and to say you're out in 30 days, right? Absolutely devastatingly. So many doctors think, ah, David, you know what? I, you know, I'm, I'm planning to retire in 10 years, so I'll just run out my lease, right? When the opposite can be true. If you've got a million dollar producing practice, you want as much term and options as possible because these days, you know, Bank of America, one of the other you know, sponsors for many of our courses, right, they cannot get uh, a purchase loan approved by their underwriters if there's insufficient term on the lease. Meaning, if you're a month-to-month -month tenant and your buyer wants to go to the bank and say, hey, can I get a million bucks? They're going to say no way. Because unless, right, there's no way they're going to give a 10-year or a 12-year payback period if there's only a few months left on the lease, right? So that's the, the big component here. And this was a prime example of that, where basically the sellers were shocked to learn that the purchaser, right, wouldn't buy, the lender can't finance a practice unless there's that long-term lease in place, right? So the six potential sellers and buyers weren't able to list their practice for sale and all had to walk away from their practices, all because they didn't have those long-term leases that they could just simply transfer on and pass on the golden keys with the patient charts and the turnkey practice, right? And suddenly now they were now, you know, selling, selling their charts for far less than what that would have been the sum of its parts. Uh, and the fourth real disastrous clause came from looking at it through the eyes of the purchaser. And this is one where the purchaser actually killed the deal after the seller had spent over 20 grand of legal fees, purchaser over 9,000, purely from the situation where they had agreed to everything, they had done the full negotiations, they had agreed to price, right? The purchaser had a corporate entity, there was eight other locations, strong balance sheet, right? Purchaser uh, was coming from out of state and into the market, right? Landlord was a simple real estate trust, Right. And basically the landlord wanted as much covenants as possible and had very high requirements for the future buyer. So the seller with two years left on the lease, right, uh, was then responsible for a personal guarantee. Can you imagine going to sell yet collateralizing yourself and hoping to God that that new buyer didn't default or didn't have any specific issues? Right. So all the lawyers start ramping up all the fees, et cetera. Right. Tell the broker to not getting involved with the lease negotiations, handle it. It's needless to say, it didn't. It all went sideways. And unfortunately, uh, 29 grand illegal, and suddenly the deal died. So, you know, again, where does it go wrong? This, right, as David touched on the sign curve and key things to look for. 
for those of you following along with a digital copy of your lease, this is what you want to look for. And this is the section you want to look for, which is typically referred to as the assignment clause or the assignment and subletting clause. So at a very high level, take a quick moment now, and this is on purpose, right? Just read through the first few lines and try to identify where the red flags are in this lease. As David and I do some of these in person, I then ask from the back of the room, and who enjoys reading their lease agreement? <laughs> no different than who enjoys their weekly reconciliation statements. Who enjoys hiring staff? Yeah, same, same group. Bang on. So what did we find first here, guys? So the first wasn't too hard to find. Most NRC e-courses will typically say, oh, well, you know, the landlord's got three options. But even before that, realize that how little control that you have on the sale of your clinic. Almost every lease on the planet, the landlord has the control to say no, right? And must have the written consent of the landlord to approve that sale. And if the wind is blowing the wrong way, they could have these rights, which is simply three different pathways. So just for asking, to sell the clinic, the landlord has three options. Number one, approve, right? Great, Dr. Harris, fantastic, right? Nice guy, will allow you to assign the lease. Number two, no, nope, I don't think so. I don't like the cut of David's jib. And no, you are not allowed to sell the lease. Well, you can sell it, but certainly you won't, uh, David won't have the lease. We won't assign the lease from you to David. Right. Or number three, just for asking to sell your clinic, to terminate your lease effective on the date of the proposed close. So meaning if David, and I, David agreed to buy my practice for a million bucks and suddenly that was due to close on July 1st and we went to the landlord and hey, we got two weeks that shouldn't take that long for the landlord to send us the assignment and assumption agreement. Ah, that should be fine. Suddenly now the landlord can come back and say, devastatingly, no, and not only no, but that balance of the nine year lease that you have remaining, right, is basically done on July 1st and you're out. Just think about that. Put yourself in that doctor's situation. What would you do, right? Who would you call? And the whole time you're thinking, my God, how did I get myself into this situation where suddenly now the landlord is holding all of the cards, considering my, you know, your decades worth of hard work, right? And blood, sweat and tears and protecting yourself from embezzlement and everything else to come to the far end. And here we have the landlord holding the cards. And right? Eric, you're going to be especially vulnerable to this if your lease is kind of below market rent. For sure. Right. If, if you're in an if you're in an attractive lease, that's when the landlord's going to say, "Okay, this is my chance to replace a lower paying tenant with a higher paying one." Right, and that's a great point, David. I mean, as you as your section was, you know, why do employees steal? Well, look, yeah. why do why do landlords, you know, make the decisions that they do? And look, you can't fault them. There's no college of landlords, right? There's no set of you know ethics on those sides, but they it is a for profit business. And many of them find a way that they can increase profit without a penny of additional expense simply by running out the clock in lease negotiations or delaying until the last minute. Or many landlords are getting squeezed now more than ever with their debt, right? Their interest rates have gone up dramatically. And, you know, walk at your practice today, look to the left, look to the right. You know, who are they going to squeeze first? Is it the florist? Right, that might be still behind in rent from COVID. Is it the nail salon? Is it the smoke shop? Is it the liquor store? Right, or is it the dental tenant? Right, that's had incredible uh, success and has expanded into the adjacent suite. So here's the section that, as David mentioned, right, suddenly now it even gives the landlord the option to increase the rent to either market price or 15% greater than the rent that you're paying today. So if you feel you have a sweetheart deal and you want to assign that on, well, hang on a second, that's only good for you. That's not necessarily transferable to your buyer. No different than the options to renew. 
Most doctors are shocked when I tell them that their options are personal to them and are not transferable to the future buyer, right? So ultimately here, this other section is the consideration language. And this is happening more and more often, just ask your local practice broker, where suddenly now landlords are asking now, or in some cases requiring a percentage of their practice sale proceeds in exchange for their signature and the assignment of the lease. We had a doctor that sold, right, that reached out to us with two of his practices that was selling to a larger corporation, right, for over two and a half million dollars. The landlord said, the first location, no problem, separate location for the second said no, right? We don't want a corporate tenant, we're thinking of redeveloping. And the only way we'll allow you to assign the lease is for a check for $160,000, all the remaining payments on the lease, right? But still charging the new tenant the lease as well. So that doctor, what did he do? And all the lawyers involved in everything else in the end, he said, look, I'm not gonna jeopardize the sale at the 11th hour, a $2 million plus paycheck, right? He paid it and he signed a check to the landlord for $160,000 for a single signature, transferring it for him as the assignor, right? To the corporate buyer as the assignee, right? So <laughs> for his next clinic, he hired us because obviously he realized that this one little clause impacted hundreds of thousands of dollars of liability. Uh, and last but not least, right? How do landlords do it, right? This is in even more than 75% of leases, right? I'll bet you lunch that this is in your lease, right? So therefore, what it states here, somewhere in your lease, it can be in a dozen different places hidden, but it basically states that regardless of the landlord's assignment, right? Or subletting or approval, the tenant shall not be released of its obligations under this lease and shall remain fully liable, let it be personally, corporately, et cetera, for any failure of the tenant or its subtenants to observe and, and, uh, and be responsible for the same lease today. So in other words, you sell it, you're in the same predicament as you are today. Uh, one of my colleagues did a, a course in Michigan and doctors, we pulled up a similar clause, raised his hand and said, this exact same thing happened to me. I retired, I was down in Florida, right? I got a phone call from the landlord a few years later and said, unfortunately, the doctor that he sold to, right, has left, can't find him and is now in default of the lease. So per the lease agreement, he remained as liable as he was. So not only was he responsible for the last four or five months worth of the lease agreement, right, in terms of the back rent, but he was also responsible for the remaining four and a half years left on the existing lease. Again, can you imagine getting that phone call, right? In retirement, after the license has lapsed and he stopped doing your CE credits and everything else. So he actually had to reopen, right? He had to find an associate, had to get his office manager back and to reopen the clinic all because of this one little clause, right? One of dozens hidden in your lease agreement. What's the cost of this? Well, it goes without saying, but it can be hundreds of thousands of dollars, let alone the sleepless nights, all potentially preventable by properly, proactively renegotiating that lease agreement. Uh, you know, uh, again, personal client of mine wrote a beautiful five-star Google review, was forced to relocate at 74 years of age. Here's a doctor, right, who is an absolute sweetheart had been practicing her entire life, had done so much for her family and her patients. She tried to sell her clinic three separate times. Each and every time the landlord found a reason to say no, right? So she was forced to relocate. Why? Because he owned another spot in the mall and he wanted her corner units to move, right? His business into. So Going through all of that, can you imagine being at the end stage of your career and being forced to pick up and relocate it? Luckily, we were able to find a location pretty close by, right? The landlord is willing to cover 100% of the build it costs, and we were able to negotiate an incredible deal that, you know, again, certainly does not happen every day. But just the, the thought process of being, you know, <laughs> three quarters of a century old, practicing your entire career, and now to be able to pull out that value, right, we're stuck. Here's another great example of a doctor who had missed their option to renew, got into a very difficult situation, 
And similar to David's video, right? Here's, here's what he was shocked to find out. My name is Sam Thatcher. I'm a general dentist here in San Francisco, and I'm also the team dentist for the San Francisco Giants. I've been practicing about 20 years. I've been in this space for 16 years. We actually started from scratch. This was an empty space when we started. And we had a family friend who's an attorney look over the lease for us. Although we really didn't negotiate that much because we were just really excited to get in and start practicing. After practicing for 15 years, my lease was coming up for renewal and I actually missed the renewal deadline. So that made me pretty nervous and anxious about renegotiating a new lease with fair and affordable terms to protect me and my family. My Henry Schein sales rep, Ellen Hong, is the one who recommended Sirius Consulting Group to us. She's been our sales rep for years and I really trust everything she recommends to us. So when Sirius looked over my lease, they found several major issues. The assignment clause gave my landlord the right to terminate my lease and throw me out of the practice if I tried to assign the practice to someone else. There's a clause in the lease that says that the owners are entitled to half of the funds from a sale. In other words, if I were to sell my practice for a million dollars, they would receive $500,000 of that. And the new owner, if they were to default, I would be on the hook financially. There was the relocation clause, which said that they could actually relocate this practice to somewhere else in the building at any time and I would be left on the hook uh, financially for that move. After reviewing the lease, it was a no-brainer to retain Cirrus to handle my lease negotiations. Cirrus was able to negotiate some very reasonable rental rates. They were also able to eliminate the relocation clause completely. They were also able to renegotiate the assignment clause. This took away my landlord's rights to any of the practice sale proceeds. It also took away their right to terminate the lease and it took me off the hook financially if the new owner were to default. Cirrus was also able to negotiate $6,000 in a tenant improvement allowance to allow me to remodel my space. They also negotiated a five-year option to renew and they gave me the ability to review any operating costs charged to me by the landlord to make sure I'm being charged fairly for any CAM fees or other operating expenses. Overall, Cirrus was able to save me the stress of negotiating my own lease. Plus, they saved me hundreds of thousands of dollars in future lease mistakes that could have been detrimental to my practice. I was very fortunate to work with Cirrus in this process. You have no idea what kind of risks are hiding in your lease agreement until you have a professional look over your lease. You have to be careful. That's why it's important to have a professional dental lease negotiator on your side, like Cirrus. So ultimately, you know, it's a Dr. Thatcher similar situation. Right. Landlord saw the opportunity to you know, basically put a very, very landlord friendly lease in front of the doctor, leveraging just dozens of these clauses, which are very negotiable and did this. Right. And this is how landlords learn to win. This is what's referred to as a tenant lease cycle, which is simply considered a clock on the wall. Best time to start lease negotiations are 24 months prior to expiry. Right? In this particular case, most landlords will delay, stall, et cetera, until you get to the 12 month point. And guess what happens then? That's the time you have to give written notice to the landlord or those remaining options to renew, those two five-year options have now become null and void. So without a penny of additional expense, just by running at the clock, the landlord has deferred, delayed, et cetera. And now suddenly you're three months out, you're scrambling and whatever that landlord puts in front of you, you'll end up signing. So how do you protect yourself? Number one, get all the facts and documentation. If you don't have a lease that's signed by both you and the landlord, it's not worth the paper it's written on, right? So get, email them today to say, hey, please send me a copy of my digital uh, lease as well as any amendments, riders and exhibits, right? So you've got that complete piece on file. Then figure out the long-term goals, right? Have the lease reviewed. So at least now and think about when your transition plan is, what it, and is your lease aligned to that long-term transition plan? Keep the term for you, keep the options to renew for your future buyer, right? Number three is, right? Help to understand where the risks are in the lease. So at least know. Number four is have the data, rental rates, vacancies, demographics, et cetera, right? Know what the market rates are today. Uh, and then have a, an outcome. Figure out that carefully choreographed game of chess first, but please don't tomorrow morning grab the phone, 
right? Call up your landlord and skip sections one, two, five and suddenly say, okay, great. What do you want to charge me? Right? Go in with it with a plan. No different than David's advice with potential employee theft. Don't walk up to the employee and say, oh, geez, I watched this embezzlement webinar, right? Let me see your, your reports, right? The skill, the tactic is key, and you certainly don't want to disclose too much information to the landlord that might decrease your leverage. So as we wrap up here, there's a final poll. Again, an appreciation of everyone's time. We're happy to do a full complimentary lease review. We have demographics, rental rates, et cetera, right? As well as you'll see from David's poll, happy to do the same, right? And do a complimentary consultation call as well and appreciation for everyone's time, right? The big theory and, and the process here today is to not get stuck. Be proactive. When you're stuck, it's too late. It happens all too often, let it be transitions, lease negotiations, employee theft and beyond. And for those that think it'll never happen to you, unfortunately the statistics and the data tells us otherwise, right? My view is if there's a 1% chance that any of these can be an issue or embezzlement could be an issue or could impact the value of your practice, why risk it? At least know what the facts are. Uh, so for those of you, I know a number of you had joined a little later, a couple of questions here for the poll, right? And, uh, and a quick question here in terms of uh, a following up. And if you say yes, uh, we're happy to connect you with uh, David and his team as well. So from that perspective, uh, going to some quick Q&A. And uh, David, I mean, the first question, we've got some of the chat Q&A and feel free to run through as we go through. But, uh, and again, any doctors, any additional questions, the Q&A is open. Uh, but David, what's what's the first thing as the doctor drives into the office tomorrow and starts thinking about this and thinking about the behavior that, hey, my office manager really has been a little distant lately, and she has been a little reluctant to take vacation, and she has been a little more resistant for me asking for additional data and reports. What's one of the first things they should do as they're driving to the office tomorrow, David? What's uh, what's 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 the first piece of guidance there? I'm going to answer that question in the negative. I'm going to talk about what not to do. And what not to do, Eric, is to let the person you suspect know that they're under suspicion. Why? Because if I'm stealing from you, my boss, and I think I'm about to get caught, and I think the consequence of getting caught is that I'll go to jail, the list of things that I'll refuse to do to prevent all that is pretty short. Um, and we have seen actions like, somebody burning down the practice as a way of, you know, and you, you talk about making a mess of your lease, that's, that's probably the best way to do it imaginable. Um, burn down the practice. Um, and in three cases that I'm aware of, and I'll mention that we were not involved in, either, in any of these three cases, the doctor was actually murdered by the embezzler. So um, the, uh, the, the most crucial thing is don't, make the suspect aware that they're a suspect. Don't go and change anything in your practice management software. Don't uh, go in your private office and close the door and get on the phone with your accountant for the next hour. What you do need to do is you need expert help and you need it now. And one of the things that Eric and I have in common is that um, we, we, we work um, in the same environment as some competitors who I would call well-intentioned dabblers. In other words, you know, there are people like lawyers who will help you with a lease negotiation. Do they have the level of expertise of Eric and his team? Not in a million years. Um, you know, sometimes people with an embezzlement concern will go to their accountant or a software trainer or a consultant or somebody and, and try to get help. And the, this, is a, this is a very specialized field and it just doesn't go well. Uh, and you can end up making matters a lot worse. When you, when you do wake up in the morning with that feeling in the pit of your stomach, um, what you have to recognize is at that moment, your practice is a crime scene and you have to treat it like a crime scene. I mean, if, if it was a, a physical crime scene, you wouldn't go uh, traipsing through the evidence because, because somebody somewhere is gonna get very mad at you, same thing. So you need expert help and you need it right now. Got it, appreciate it. And uh, great feedback, uh, Dr. M just asked, excellent information, will I get a copy of the recording for the seminar? Uh, yes, 
Uh, we certainly will be uh, following up. If you didn't already, there's a, usually an exit piece with the request for the recording. Uh, we're happy to follow up with the, uh, the direct link for you as well. Uh, and, and again, from that perspective, every situation is unique. So obviously a lot of this is some generality. Uh, great idea. If you haven't already, uh, have, a, have a, just a quick conversation with David or one of the members of his team, and it will certainly give a good perspective on the scenario, as well as some good practical guidance on the process, uh, and certainly, again, what not to do. So, perfect. Great. Uh, on that note, truly appreciate everyone's time. I know we've gone a few minutes over, but that was, uh, again, fantastic content. Uh, we really appreciate certainly Henry Shine for uh, sponsoring and supporting this tonight. Uh, again, we're doing our best to, to advocate. You've got, uh, again, if nobody's patted you on the back for going through these past few years as a business owner, you should. The fact that you've come at the far side and you're now taking steps to not, you know, stick your head in the proverbial sand, but to continue to help protect yourself and what you've worked so hard to, uh, to secure. Right. We certainly appreciate everyone's time and, uh, and we'll certainly uh, look forward to speaking to you all soon. And on that note, uh, we'll pass it back. Uh, we'll pass it back to you, Shelley. Wow. Thank you so much, uh, both of you, for a wonderful presentation this evening. Really fascinating. And thank you all for joining us tonight. We did record tonight's webinar, as Eric mentioned earlier, and we'll be emailing the recording out sometime in the next week. We would appreciate your feedback via our survey that will pop up shortly on your screen. And thank you again for joining us. We look forward to seeing you on future webinars. Have a wonderful evening. Mm -hmm.